ask you to look at verse number one and verse number two. Hebrews 12, verses one and verse number two, and, and verse number three as well. And uh, then perhaps we will share a reading with you from uh, the book of Luke, chapter 23. And the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. This passage of Scripture was written by Paul the Apostle, and uh, uh, he warns us to be careful as we run this race of life. And he warns us not to allow anything to hinder us or to keep us from that path that God has put us on. Uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 23, and verse 32, it speaks of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it says, verse 32, and there were two other male factors or two other male individuals that were led with Christ to be put to death. And when they came to the place which is called Calvary, they crucified him. And the male factors or the men that were on the right hand and on the left hand as well, they crucified him. My subject tonight for just a few moments, removing the clutter from Calvary. Removing the clutter from Calvary. Would you say that with me? Removing the clutter from Calvary. Now, Lord Jesus Christ, I, I pray for your hand to be shown and revealed in this service tonight. Lord, there are so many things that would vie for our attention and that would, that would reach for our, uh, our interest and Lord, many of them are, are good things in, in life. Lord, many of them are, are things that are very rewarding in life. Nothing wrong with. But Lord, may we guard very, very uh, diligently that place called Calvary in our lives, that place of commitment to you. Lord, if we're not careful, there are things that would clutter that path to Calvary and that Calvary experience. So, Lord, help me to speak tonight from that perspective. And, Lord, that you would, uh, that you would speak more uh, into the hearts of men and women by the things that are not said tonight than the things that are spoken. For, Lord, that can happen only by the, the moving of your Spirit as you address each and every person who is here. Thank you for touching all those that are listening. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And everybody say, removing the clutter from Calvary. God bless you. You may be seated tonight. Amen. In the presence of the Lord. When I think of Calvary and I think of the cross, uh, I think of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that uh, Calvary was a predetermined and a predestined uh, place where Jesus Christ was going to go. It was the purpose of God that Jesus Christ would bring salvation to all men and women, that he would die on the cross, and that that death on the cross would bring the gospel, the good news to you and I. And that good news would uh, declare that we do not have to be lost, we do not have to be sinners, but that God can save us and will save us when we embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. In order for uh, that to happen, Jesus Christ had a destiny that had to be fulfilled in his life. His destiny was the cross. And when he went to the cross, the purpose of him going to the cross is that uh, he would buy back and he would purchase salvation for every man and woman that would say yes to him. And so it was that Jesus Christ, he came and he did go to the cross. It's interesting when you read the word of God that the Christ and the cross of Christ was uh, predestined and predetermined and prefigured and pre-shadowed in the Old Testament Word of God. The purpose of Christ was discovered in the words of Isaiah 750 years before he came to this earth. Whenever Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, 
and with his stripes we are healed. And so there Isaiah declared the purpose of God. But the purpose of God would never be fulfilled until the destiny for his life was fulfilled. Even the angel understood the predetermined plan of God whenever he spoke of Christ and he said to Joseph, Joseph, thou son of David, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. He says, that which she is going to bring forth is of God, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And though John, the cousin of Jesus, grew up with the Lord, and they were six months removed in their, their age differences, um, I don't believe that John ever realized the purpose and the destiny of Jesus Christ until that day after he baptized, or the day that he baptized the Lord. And John 1 and 29 says that John then declared, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And so the purpose of Christ was to bring about a cure for the sins of mankind. And the purpose of Christ was to resurrect all that had died in Adam. The purpose of Christ has not changed for 2,000 years. And he still desires men and women to be saved. He still desires you and I to be able to be a part of the kingdom of God. And understand that though the purpose of Christ... Uh, it would only be recognized after he embraced his destiny there to go to the cross. And so as I think of the cross and I think of Calvary, uh, you and I have a Calvary experience when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we say yes to the Lord, whether we just began by repentance or making a declaration of faith in our lives, or we go on to water baptism and go on to being filled with the Holy Spirit, and then even after that, walking with the Lord and learning about uh, uh, trusting in God and functioning and flowing in the gifts of the Spirit according to 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 and walking in the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit according to Galatians 5. You and I, we have a Calvary experience. We have a, an experience that is based upon Calvary. And so whenever I talk about removing the clutter from Calvary, I'm talking about removing the clutter that is there between you and the experience that God has given you, whether it was last week or five years ago or 25 or 45 years ago. All of us must remove the clutter that has a tendency to gather there on the road to Calvary. And so you understand what my premise is here tonight. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that you and I, we must lay aside every weight and the sin which does oh so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand or the power, the authority of Almighty God. And so Paul here, he tells you and I as Christians that we must remove the things in our lives that are a hindrance and that clutter up that road to Calvary. If we're not careful, there are things that are not bad things in this world, but things that come in our life that, that squeeze out that time and that experience with Almighty God. And that's what I'm talking about tonight. If we're not careful, we allow things that are not sin and things that are not wrong to take the place that once that experience with God and once that time alone with God it had in our lives and once that attention in our lives had with God. I guess the best way I can describe that is when a husband and wife, they are married and, and for the first year or so after they are married they are so in love with each other and not to say they're not in love with each other after that time but uh, if we're not careful that, that love, that excitement, that enthusiasm, that experience that we had at that, at that altar, that wedding altar, and, that, uh, and saying yes and I do to that person, it, it wanes and it, and it wears out. If we're not careful, the problems of life, they, they have a tendency to wear upon us, and pretty soon mama's upset, and then daddy's upset because mama's upset, and pretty soon you've got a whole set of problems that are there. Is there anybody here that knows what I'm talking about? Please say amen. Amen. And so that's the, way, that's the best way I can explain that. When we come to the Lord, there is a romance, there is a, 
There was, a, there was a honeymoon experience is what they told me when I first got saved. And they said, well, you might as well enjoy this honeymoon while you've got it because the time is going to come when you're going to get off the honeymoon and you're going to have to start really living by faith. And you know what? I found that was true. After about six months of being on a honeymoon with Jesus Christ, all of a sudden I realized that I still had some problems in my life. I realized that I was still going to have some challenges and people were going to make me mad and, and temptation was going to still be there. But I had to make up my mind time after time and I still have to do that today that I'm not going to allow any of those things to clutter that road to Calvary. I'm not going to allow those things to keep me from that relationship and that experience with Almighty God. Do you know what? That you've got to work on your relationship with God. You've got to work on your relationship in, a, in being a friend. The Bible says if a person wants friends, they must what? They must show themselves friendly. You can't expect to have friends in this world and just never talk to anybody. Never uh, uh, open yourself up to anybody. I've had people say, well, I want friends, but I'll, I'll never open up to anybody. You will never have any friends then. All you'll have is a bunch of surface relationships. But, and the reason why, the problem is not everybody else. The problem is you because you won't let your guard down in order to be transparent enough with those that truly do love you and those that truly God has called into your life to be able to, to put some things in your life that will help you. You must show yourself friendly and you must become vulnerable to those individuals that are your friends. You must set yourself up even to be hurt at times and to be done wrong at times. And the reason why is because that is all a part of friendship. And so it is in the kingdom of God. You and I have to work on that relationship with the Lord. When you get up in the morning, you've got to work on, Good morning, Jesus. I thank you for this day. And you've got to work on talking with Him throughout the day. You've got to work on your spirituality. You've got to work on your knowledge of the Word of God. You've got to work on the fact that you're going to love people and that you're going to love the church of God. And if you don't work on that, then all of a sudden things begin to clutter that road. And that experience to Calvary, amen, it becomes cluttered by things that we have allowed. And pretty soon we grow cold in our spirit. Every time you look in the Word of God where people became cold in their spirit. It was because they allowed things in their lives that, that may not have been sinful things, but they were things that they put before God. This is why the, one of the commandments was that thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because God said, anything that you put before me, whether it's right or it's wrong, whether it is a, a good thing or a bad thing, it becomes a bad thing when we place that in front of God. I've seen women put Husbands in front of God. Husbands who have said, if you don't quit God and you don't quit living for God, then I'm going to leave you. And they've come to me and they've said, Pastor, what am I going to do? I said, well, you have only one choice, and that is to live for God. You will have only one right choice, and that is to live for God. And they said, but if I do that, my husband is going to leave me. And I said, well, you have to make that choice. I've seen husbands uh, leave uh, the church and leave Almighty God because of their wife or because of children. Children that perhaps uh, were, were there and that had uh, said or done or acted in ways that, and they placed those children before God. And those children are that which clutters that road to Calvary and become a God to that man or that woman. I've seen other people place jobs and employment in front of God. The jobs have cluttered that road to Calvary. And I realize all of us, we must work. And the scripture teaches us that if a man does not work, neither should he eat. But you know that there is a, a limit to that. Even in our job, we must place that job in the hands of Almighty God. And we must understand that it's God that has given us that job, and it's not the job that has given us God. Amen? And the moment that we have that backwards, that job becomes a, a hindrance and a place that clutters that, that, that road to Calvary and that experience with Almighty God. Even Jesus Christ, there was a clutter that, that you see as He was making His way to the cross. There was the clutter of temptation. Do you remember? In Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says Jesus was led of the Spirit up into the wilderness, there to be tempted of the devil after His 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. And three times the devil spoke to Him. And He said, Command these stones to be turned to bread. Cast thyself down and fall down in worship. 
But every time these were brought to him as a stumbling block, as a clutter between him and his destiny, that place of the cross, Jesus Christ answered with a word, and he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And so it is, you and I will be tempted as Christ was tempted. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 that he was tempted in all points and yet without sin. And what that leads me to believe and understand is if Christ Jesus was tempted, you and I are going to be tempted as well. And the chance is this, that the temptations, when we yield to them, they become the clutter between us us and our destiny, us and that Calvary experience with Almighty God. What is your temptation tonight? What is it that clutters the place of Calvary, the road to Calvary between you and Almighty God? Who is it that has cluttered that road that was there? Also, something that Jesus Christ had to face was, was the opinion and the influence of others. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus showed his death and his resurrection to the apostles. And he told them, I'm going to the cross. If you remember, he was there with his disciples. And the Bible says that Peter stood up and he rebuked the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, be it far from thee, Lord. He says, don't allow that to happen. It's not true. It's not going to happen. And yet Jesus Christ he had to say, I'm not going to yield to unsanctified opinion and the influence of even my friends. I'm not going to allow that to clutter the road to Calvary. And so the Bible says Jesus spoke up to Simon Peter, one that he loved, and he says, Get behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest the things that be, that be of man and not those things that are, that are of God. And so this evening, what is the unsanctified opinion or influence that is there in your life? It may be people on the job. It may be people that you have allowed into your life and you have allowed them access to places that even you don't allow your Christian brothers and sisters. That you have revealed something about yourself and you have opened yourself up to people that don't even have the Spirit of God in their heart. They have no desire to follow after the things of God. Be careful of unsanctified opinion and unholy influence in your life. I'm not saying that these people are bad people. I'm not saying that what they're telling you are wrong things. But what I am saying is that you need godly men and women of influence. And you need to make sure that the opinions and the influence that is there in your life, it comes by and through Almighty God. Otherwise, it becomes a clutter on that road to Calvary. What else you may say is a clutter on the road to Calvary? A cluttered closet of prayer. When we allow things to come into our lives and we have no time to read the Word of God. We have no time to pray and to seek Almighty God. Notice the only way that Calvary, he could get to Calvary, he had to go by way of prayer. You see, he was Almighty God. Yes, he was. But Jesus Christ demonstrated to you and I, in order for us to get to that Calvary experience, we must go by way of prayer. He went to Gethsemane. And in Gethsemane, he prayed in earnest, the Bible says. And his sweat became as great drops of blood. He poured out his soul, even unto death. And he was able to say, until he was able to say, not my will but thine. You see, sometimes the only thing that stands between us and that Calvary experience, once again, is just a good old-fashioned prayer meeting. Sometimes the only thing that stands between us and a good old-fashioned prayer meeting is a re-evaluation and a reorganization of our priorities and the things in our life. Where does the power of prayer fall in your life? Do you still pray? Do you still talk to God as you have in times past? Do you still believe that prayer is something that God hears and that God answers? Do you still believe that prayer makes a difference? If not, my friend, then you need to come back and you need to talk to God one more time. And the very reason why we don't pray is because we don't believe that prayer makes a difference. And so it becomes a cluttering place in our life. What is the closet of prayer cluttered with in your life? What is it that is there that keeps you from Almighty God? In the Old Testament, they had talked about, and I'm coming to a close here. You say, well, you didn't scream and holler and hoop and holler. Sometimes I think I scream and hoop and holler too much. And sometimes I think I just scream the Holy Ghost right out of the building, the Lord has said in times past. 
It's not that I intended to do that. But you know, if we're not careful, we become so Pentecostalized that we cannot hear the still, small voice of Almighty God. And if we're not careful, we become so accustomed to hearing somebody scream and yell at us, we don't think that they preached at all until after they've spit and sputtered and, and screamed and yelled. Amen. It becomes hard for us to be able to hear what God really is saying to us. Amen. Sometimes God says, I'm not going to speak to you in, this, in the loud voice. I'm not going to speak to you, uh, Elijah, in the whirlwind. I'm not going to speak to you in the thunderings uh, that are there, but I'm going to speak to you in the still, small voice of God. I want to talk to you, God says. And so as uh, I think about the Old Testament, uh, I'm reminded of, of, uh, of Joshua. When Joshua went across the... the uh, the, the river Jordan, and he crossed to the other side. The water parted, and they walked on dry ground, and that was God's symbol to him. That was God signifying to Joshua, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. I've transferred my power, my authority, my anointing that was upon him. I've transferred that upon you, Joshua. And when Joshua went across, the Lord commanded him, he says, you take and you give cities to all of the heads of the, of the nation of Israel, and you give them an inheritance. You all remember reading that? We read that not too long ago in our bread program. But there were six cities, the Bible says, that they were told to, to specifically set one on this side of the Jordan, or three on this side of the Jordan, and three on the other side of the Jordan. And he says, these cities are cities of refuge. The cities of refuge, they were for this. They were to be cities that would have somebody guarding there at the gate. And if anyone was in any trouble, if they have killed somebody, and uh, uh, they had had problems, and, and they were looking for a, a fair trial, they were looking for mercy, they were to run to those cities of refuge. For you see, in those days, if you had, were out with your friend, and you were cutting wood, and the axe fell off of the, uh, of the axe, the axe head fell off of the handle that you were cutting with, and it flew to where that friend was at, and it hit him in the head, and it killed him, then his next of kin, they could come, and they could take your life. After all, remember the word of God said in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I'm so glad it's not that way today, amen? Amen. I'm so glad it's not that way today. But in those days, that's the way that it was. And so when a man, his axe had slipped and it hit that man and it killed him, then his family, the, the deceased family, could run and chase that man down and kill him. No questions asked, they would not be charged for it. And so with that man that had made that accident, who had had the accident, he began to flee for the city of refuge. He began to run with all of his heart. And when he approached that city, even if the people were chasing after him to be able to uh, uh, bring uh, a vengeance or to, to uh, vilify that which had been done to their family member, they had to stop at the entrance of the gate of that city. And the governor would say, you can't go any further. They were protected in that city of refuge. It's so interesting, and in the future, again, I've preached about it in times past, every one of those cities, they had a specific name. And the name, it recognized and it symbolized the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, our city of refuge is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we come running to Him. And as we come running to Him, it is there that we find protection and forgiveness. But the interesting thing that I learned in the Old Testament about these cities of refuge were that they were to allow the, the highways to be open and unencumbered. There were to be no clutter there on the road to that city. You know why? So that those that were fleeing to that city, they would be able to have easy access. And so tonight, I come to you and I say that it's time that we remove the clutter from Calvary. Could it be that even as a church, we have set some boundaries and we have set some clutter there in front of the lives of men and women that even God himself does not require? Could it be that we have cluttered that road to Calvary with so many things that, that, that uh, may be good things, but they're not God things? And now they become a hindrance, not only for others to be able to make their way to the cross and become a part of that local church in the kingdom of God, but they become impossible for you and I even to be able to, part of it, to be a part of it as well. And I believe that the Holy Ghost would say to us tonight, we need to remove the clutter from Calvary. 
Remove everything that is there that keeps us from that experience called Calvary. Lord, take us back to the cross. Lord, take us back to the place where we first believed you. Lord, take me back once again and remind me where I was at and how good God you were in order to bring me in. The old song used to say it this way, roll back the curtain of memories now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Reminding us of where we were and where God has brought us. Calvary, we need to, remove, we need to allow Calvary to be uncluttered, that road to Calvary. Tonight, as we consider the Word of God, I ask you, is there anything in your life that is cluttering that road to Calvary? Do you have relationships with people that are your friends that really are unholy relationships? And, uh, and the Lord is saying, you need to break that off. You need to separate yourself from those things. Are there things in your life where you are doing that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about? And He's saying, uh, the reason why we're not as close as we used to be is because you have some clutter on the road to Calvary. What is the Lord saying to you tonight? You say, well, Wendell, are you, are you preaching down my throat? No, I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching to you. And my desire is not to see you flounder. My desire is not to see you hurt. My desire is not to see you defeated or to fail. But my desire as a pastor is, is to see you successful as a Christian man, a Christian woman, a Christian boy, a Christian girl. And the only way that's going to happen is if we allow in our own lives the road to Calvary to be uncluttered so that we can go back and we can touch Him again and again and again. And so tonight, as we come to the end of this message, I ask you to examine yourselves for just a moment of time. I ask you that you would allow the searchlight of your spirit to shine upon you and say, Lord, is there anything in my life that should not be there? Lord, are there things that are keeping me from what you want me to be and all you want me to become? If so, then confess that to the Lord and ask the Lord to help you with that. We're getting ready in just a moment to receive communion and uh, the brethren can come and they can, they can set that communion up while I speak. The Apostle Paul spoke in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in verse number 23. He said, I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it. And he said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death till he come. Whoever eats this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So he said, let a man examine himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse, 30, verse 28. Let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And because of this, my brethren, when you come together eat to eat, tarry one for another. The Apostle Paul was very clear of the importance of communion for each and every one of us. He said, as we approach the communion table of the Lord, he said, look at yourself. Don't look at others, but you need to look at yourself. And he says, you're only responsible for you. Did you know that the only one that uh, will be responsible for others in this congregation is not you, but it's the pastor. 
I will have to one day give an account for each of you that God has placed within my safekeeping. But none of you will have to ever give an account for me. Aren't you happy for that? <laughs> Amen. But one day I have to give an account for you. And that's why at times people come and say, well, why don't you just do this to them? Well, the reason why is because one day I have to stand before the Lord, and so I'd be very careful what I do. But there is one thing that you will have to give an account for, and that is yourself. And so tonight, Paul said, when you approach the communion table of the Lord, look at yourself. Do a, an evaluation and say, am I living the way that the Lord wants me to live? Are there things that are cluttering the road to Calvary? Is my experience with God still as razor sharp and keen as it ever was? If not, you say, well, I can't take communion. Oh, but you can if you will simply repent and you will ask God to forgive you and you will purpose in your heart to change those things that you can change and then believe God to help you to change the things that you cannot. Then you will be ready for communion. You say, well, what if I don't want to do that and I go ahead and take communion anyway? Well, the Bible says that many people that have done that, they're weak and they're sickly. The sickness came upon them and some of them, they even sleep, they died because they have eaten and drank unworthily. They, they just did so in a half-hearted manner. The communion table of the Lord is a very serious thing. For as we come there, we remember the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This bread does not become the body of the Lord. This fruit of the vine does not become the blood of the Lord. But it is a symbol that causes us to remember what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so now, I ask us just to bow our heads and take a moment of introspection. And those that are watching online, if you would do that as well. And just talk to the Lord. And I'll pray for us all. Father, as we bow our heads tonight, Lord, we realize that all of us have challenges and all of us have shortcomings in our life. We all have things that we know should be better. But Lord, we're asking that you would help us today. And that you would forgive us for things in our lives that are not what they should be. Forgive us for attitudes that are wrong. Forgive us, Lord, those things that would clutter that, that closet of prayer, clutter the road to Calvary, that experience with you that would clutter that and keep us from having that experience and that relationship with you that you want us to have. Lord, would you forgive us tonight? And Lord, as we prepare to partake of the communion table of, of, of you, Lord, I pray that a blessing would fall upon this congregation in such a powerful, mighty way, Lord Jesus, and that you would bring healing and hope and help to everyone that is here and those that are watching online. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And while we sing tonight, we're asking if you would, uh, the ushers will direct you, they, they will begin at the back of the building, and if you would... They will, uh, they will direct you and will, uh, as you come and you get the, uh, the bread and the fruit of the vine, hold that for a moment and just as quickly as you can in your mind on the Lord as we sing just for a moment. Okay. You guys can go ahead and go down and get yours. You got it? Okay. The ushers are directing now. Yes, please, brethren, very quickly. Very quickly. I
to his disciples and he said take eat this is my body which is broken for many shall we do so together and remember the broken body of the Lord and he said take drink for this is my blood that was shed for many Shall we take and remember the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your sweet presence. Thank you for your sweet Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. We remember the body that was broken and the blood that was shed for our sins. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Halamatokoshandinimohushata Kiloramandi Hesilandarabokita Jeniminobokusha Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let the Holy Spirit flow in this house tonight. That's it. That's it. Let the Holy Spirit flow and touch our hearts. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Renew. Renew in us, oh God. Renew in us a fresh experience with you, Lord. A fresh perspective and desire, Lord. Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your people. We thank you for your people. Lord Jesus, we discern your body. Lord Jesus, we discern your body, the church. And we thank you for the church, oh, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We praise you tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for this wonderful church, O oh Lord, for the kingdom that you've placed us in. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen, 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 amen. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you for mercy when I deserve judgment. Thank you for grace when I deserved not any. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me, the ungodly. While you were on the cross, I was on your mind, Lord. You looked down through time and you saw each of us. You saw each of us, Lord, and you knew that we would say yes to you. And we so thank you for that foreknowledge that you had. We so thank you, Lord, for going to the cross. We so thank you, Lord. 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 ending to a, a beautiful service, presence of the Lord. Amen. I feel like the Lord dealt with our hearts tonight and spoke to us. Amen. Then he came in here at the end and, and he fellowshiped with us. Amen. I'm so thankful for that. that the Lord would say to us that uh, we need to be careful to discern his body. Paul addressed that in 1 Corinthians 11. When I read that several years ago, I thought that that meant discerning the physical body of the Lord and remembering that. But through the years, I've come to have a different view of that. You see, the body is the church. The body of Christ is the church. He is the head. The scripture says we are the body. We are his body. And when he talks about discerning his body, he's talking about paying attention to the members that are here. I think it'd be good if we just were in tune, not only with God, but in with, with one another. Scripture says to weep with those that weep and to rejoice with those that rejoice. And so many times, if we're not careful, we come and we look at the back of each other's head <laughs> on a Sunday or Wednesday when we have Bible study. And the Lord said, that's good. You gather to worship together. But there needs to be a community. You need to be involved with one another. Purpose to be involved with one another. You say, well... I'm afraid somebody will judge me. Well, then you don't judge anybody, all right? You don't judge your brother and sister. And by that, I'm, I'm saying that if there's something that they need to be called out on, get in uh, right relationship with them so that you can talk to them and call them out on that. And when I speak of judging, that you say, oh, no hope for you. That's what I'm talking about. We need to be involved in one another's lives and we need to be able to call out to one another when there are things that are wrong in one another's lives. Can I get an amen? The elders need to be able to speak to the younger men and women and say, hey, you know what? There's some things you need to pay attention to. As we grow, the pastor, the ministry is not going to be able to do that all. But we have a responsibility as members of the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, the local assembly to be able to help one another to go forward. And so, let's do that. Let's discern the body of Christ. God bless you tonight is our prayers. And um, uh, why don't you call a brother or sister up this next week? Not because I said so, but just because it's the right thing to do, all right? And uh, say, hey, I'm praying for you. Send them a note. Send them a Facebook message. Um, 
it just, it'll make you feel better and make them feel better too. Amen. So hope to see you this next weekend. Hope you have a great week.